Hello, everyone. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Elon. Oh, hi. I'm Drew Baglino, SVP of Powertrain and Energy Engineering at Tesla, and I'm incredibly excited to talk about what we've been doing at Batteries here at Tesla. Great. Um, so, let's see, you got the clicker? Yeah, I got the clicker, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's, let's uh, yeah, let's, I'll take it at first, perhaps. Sure. Um, so, uh, obviously, the, the, the issues we're facing are very serious, uh, you know, with the uh, climate change, and um, we're experiencing these issues on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it, it's incredibly important we accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. Uh, time really matters. Uh, this presentation is about accelerating the time to sustainable energy. So, uh, the past five years were the hottest on record. Um, we have what looks like a wall for CO2 ppm. Um, it's obviously, you know, this time is not like the past. Uh, it's it's really important that we take action. Um, ru running this uh, climate experiment is insane. So, especially when it's just a transitory one, anyway. Yes. We're going to run out of these fossil fuels. Let's just move to the future and not run this experiment any longer. Yeah. Talk, maybe talk a bit louder. You got it. Okay. Um, so anyway, <coughs> the so, so we're, we're, th there is a lot of good news though. Um, uh, uh, the uh, what <coughs> a lot of people may not be aware <coughs> that that wind and solar comprise seventy five percent of new electricity capacity in the U.S. this year. So uh, this is a really major. <coughs> um, so the the grid is the, the grid is going sustainable uh, very, very quickly. Um, now, it's also worth noting that the length of time that power plants last is <coughs> on the order of 25 years. So uh, even if 100% of uh, energy generation was sustainable, it would still take 25 years to convert the grid. Um, <coughs> and, and it's also worth noting that in the past 10 years, uh, power production from coal has dropped in half. So it went from 46% of electricity in 2010 to 23% in 2020. So this is a m massive improvement. So good things are happening on a lot of levels. We just need to go faster. Um, <coughs> so in terms of Tesla's contribution, we've, we've delivered over a million electric vehicles, 26 billion um, electric miles driven, uh, and uh, many gigawatt hours of stationary batteries, uh, 17 terawatt hours of solar generated. So. Um, I think s solar is sometimes uh, underweighted at, at, at Tesla, but I, it is a massive part of our future. Um, the three parts of a, s a sustainable energy future are sustainable energy generation, storage, and electric vehicles. So we intend to play a significant role in all three. Uh, so to, achieve, to, to accelerate, the, accelerate the transition to sustainable energy, we must produce more uh, EVs that need to be affordable um, and a lot more energy storage. Uh, while well, building fa factories faster and with fa far less investment. Um, <coughs> so, uh, goal number one is a terawatt hour scale battery production. So, tera is the new giga. Uh, and a terawatt is a, a thousand times more than a gigawatt. So, uh, we used to talk in terms of gigawatts. Uh, in the future, we'll be talking in terms of uh, terawatt hours. So, this is a um, what's needed in order to transition the world to sustainability. Um, yeah, and you can see it's a, we're talking about 100x growth in batteries for electric vehicles to achieve this mission. Um, and we are gonna get there, it's just a matter of how fast, and our intention is to accelerate it. Yeah, you basically need on the order of you know, roughly 10 terawatt hours a year of battery production uh, to transition the, the global fleet of, of vehicles to electric. And the average vehicle lasts 15 years, so we're talking about 150 terawatt hours, give or take, to transition the whole electric, all vehicles of all types uh, uh, to electric. Yeah, so it's a, it's a lot of batteries, basically. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so. And then on the grid side, uh, we, we have a similar mountain to climb, 1,600 times growth from today's grid batteries to go 100% renewable on the grid and to take all of the existing heating fossil fuel uses in homes and businesses 100% electric. Yeah, and, and this, this number, I think, uh, might grow even more, you know, as the, the world economy 
uh, matures and as uh, countries with high populations industrialize, uh, we could see this number be even more. But let's say it's like roughly uh, tw 20 uh, to 25 a terawatt hours per year sustained uh, for 15 to 25 years to transition the world to uh, renewable. This is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so today's batteries can't scale fast enough. Uh, they're just too small. Um, for Giga, Giga Nevada, um, 150 gigawatt hours per year is like what we probably expect to, to make out of there. But this is really pretty small in the grand scheme of things. That's only 0.15 terawatt hours. And they cost too much. <laughs> so we would need 135 fully built out Nevada gigafactories to achieve 20 terawatt hours a year. It's not scalable enough of a solution. We need a dramatic rethink of the cell manufacturing system to, to scale as fast as we can and should. Yeah, and I think we should view this as, as more than just a question of money. Um, money is sort of like an ethereal thing, but it's really the amount of effort. You have a, a certain amount of, of effort um, you know, in terms of people and machines. And depending on, on how fi efficient that, that effort is, um, you know, f for a given amount of effort, you, you want the most amount of batteries. So it's not just a question of like, well, if we had $2 trillion, you, tomorrow you could make this. It's, it's not that easy. Um, you actually need to organize a massive number of people, build a lot of machines, build the machines that make the machines. Um, and so it's incredibly important to uh, have that effort uh, yield the most number of batteries. So, uh, and, and then goal two, obviously, we need to make uh, more affordable cars. Um, the, uh, you know, I think one of the things that troubles me the most is that we, we don't yet have a truly affordable car, um, and that, that is something that we will make in the future. Uh, but in order to do that, um, we've got to get the cost of batteries down, we've got to make, uh, and we've got to be better at manufacturing, and, and we need to do something about this curve. This cur the curve of, of the cost per kilowatt hour of, of batteries is not improving fast enough. Um, so we, we give it, we've given this a lot of thought over many years uh, to say, okay, how can we radically improve the, the cost per kilowatt hour curve? Um, it, it's been somewhat flattening out, actually, in, in yeah. recent years. So I mean, early growth was promising, but you can see we're kind of plateauing. So that's, that's what's motivating us to, to rethink how cells are produced and designed. Yeah, exactly. So, so um, yeah, and EV market share is growing, but EVs, yeah, aren't still aren't accessible to all. Um, it's, it's, and, and you can see, it's, as Drew was saying, it's like starting to flatten out a little bit because uh, the, the rate of improvement of the affordability of cars is just not fast enough. So that's why we got battery day. So yeah. To make the best cars in the world, we design vehicles and factories from the ground up. Next. Yeah. <laughs> and now we do this for batteries as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird, the, the slides don't show up quite right. Anyway. The, what, what shows up on the screen is not quite what shows up there. And oh, okay. It's different. <laughs> yeah, I think it's because that's. Yeah. No, that one's current, supposed to be current. Anyway. So let's get started. We have a plan to have the cost per kilowatt hour. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not a plan that rests on a single innovation, some research project that'll never see the light of day. It's a plan that has taken creative engineering and industrialization across every facet of what makes a cell into a battery pack from raw material to the finished thing. And we're going to go through that plan with you today, step by step, and build up how we get to these goals and how we accelerate this transition and make our vehicles and our, our grid batteries more affordable. Yeah. I mean, we, we basically thought through every element of the battery, well, almost every element. There are a few more elements that uh, we won't get to today, but we will get to in the future. Yes. So first, before we get too far into it, let's talk about what is in a battery cell. We've got the cap and the, and the can, negative and positive terminals of the cell. When you open that cell, you've got a tab connected to those terminals, what we call the jelly roll, which is the wound electrodes on the inside. Um, you can actually see what this looks like as you unwind it. This is over a meter long in a typical 2170 cell. So it's quite a long wi winding process. Um, and, and you can see the tab still there. Um, and then 
what, to explain what's actually going on here, we've identified we've got anode, cathode, separator, positive and negative terminal. Watch what happens as we, uh, there we go, discharge the cell. We've got lithium moving from anode to cathode. And then the reverse, when we charge the cell, anode moving from, uh, lithium moving from cathode to anode across the separator. This is the basic of what makes all lithium ion batteries, whether they're, what, no, ma no matter what the form factor is. And when we look at what, what's happened to date, at least in our products, we've moved from the 18650 form factor to the 2170 form factor through great collaboration with our partners, Panasonic, new partners like LG and CATL, and probably others in the future. Actually, so a slight note on, on why, why is the one called the 18650, although not on the slide, <laughs> uh, versus the 2170, is that the, the first two digits refer to the diameter, and the second two digits refer to the length. So that, that helps explain why are these weird, what about, what's up with these weird numbers. But the, like nobody could explain to me why, why there was an extra zero. <laughs> um, so, I, so I said, like, okay, well, we're deleting the zero that nobody can explain <laughs> in, in future form factors. So that's why it's technically, it's like the 18650, bizarrely, but going forward, it's the 2170, because we just got rid of the extra zero because it's pointless. <laughs> um, and this was, this was a evolutionary step going from 1865 to 2170, bringing 50% more energy into the cell. But when we look to the ideal cell design, if we were to do it ourselves, uh, we need to go beyond just um, what we're looking at us in front of us and, and study the full, the full spectrum of options. So as you can see, we, we kind of swept the key figures of merit, how much we can reduce the cost and how much vehicle range increases as we change the outer diameter of the cell. We found a sweet spot somewhere around 46 meters, uh, two millimeters. But it's not just about a bigger form factor. Like anybody could make a bigger form factor. Any fool, any fool could make a bigger form factor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we not any fool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are problems uh, as you make cells larger, in fact, Supercharging and thermals in general become really challenging as you make bigger cells. And this was the challenge that our team uh, set our sights on to overcome. And we did. We came up with this tabless architecture that maybe you've heard about um, that, that basically removes the thermal problem from the equation and allows us to go to the absolute lowest cost form factor um, and the simplest manufacturing process. And this is what this is what we mean when we, when we talk about tabless. It's kind of a beautiful thing. Uh, yeah, that's what these t-shirts mean, but it's very esoteric. Like nobody could figure it out, but. Yeah. Um, we basically took the existing foils, laser patterned them, and enabled dozens of connections into the active material through this shingled spiral you can see. With simpler manufacturing, fewer parts, 50, 50 millimeter versus 250 millimeter electrical path length, uh, which is how we get all the thermal benefits. Yeah, this is important to pr appreciate. Like basically, the, the 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 distance that that electron has to travel, you know, it's it's just much less. Um, so uh, you actually have a shorter path length in a large tabless a large tabless cell than you have in the smaller cell with tabs. So this is a big deal. So even though the the cell is bigger, it actually has uh, more power. Uh, the power to weight ratio is actually better than the smaller cell with 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 tabs. This is. Uh, you know, again, like, this is quite, quite hard to do. It, so it's, uh, you know, nobody's done it before. Um, so, uh, and it really took a, a tremendous amount of effort uh, w within Tesla engineering to figure out how do we make a frigging tabless cell um, and have it actually work and, and then connect that to the top cap. And it's, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that we're, you know, keeping a little secret source here <laughs> that we're not telling everything. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, Sometimes <laughs> what's elegant and simple is still hard, and it, we, we, it took us a lot of trials, but we're, we're happy where we ended up. Yeah, I mean, everything's simple in, in recollection. You know, after you, like, uh, simple, everything, it's hard until it's discovered, and then it's simple. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of really cool things going on uh, that, that enable uh, tablets, and um, uh, it's really, you know, due to a really great engineering team, Drew and the, and the rest of the team have done amazing work in, in achieving this uh, tabless construction. Um, and it sounds, I think it may sort of sound a bit silly to some people, but <laughs> this was, this is like, if for people that really know cells, this is a massive breakthrough. For cylindricals to be able to, to get rid of the tabs dramatically simplifies winding and coating. Yeah. And has an awesome thermal and performance benefit. 
Yeah, um, that's a, uh, just to be so elaborate on that a bit. It's like when the cell is is going going through the the, the system, the system it, it has to keep stopping where all the tabs are. Yes. So you can't do a continu you can't do continuous motion uh, uh, production uh, if you have tabs. You have to keep stopping, and and then there's a rate at which you can start and stop and accelerate again, and and it really slows down the the rate of production. And then sometimes you get the tabs wrong. Um, and you also get lose a little bit of, of, of active area. It's 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 really a huge pain in the ass to have tabs um, yes. from a production standpoint. Yes. Um, and so when we put it all together and go to our new 80 millimeter length, 4680, we call this uh, new cell design. We get five times the energy with six times the power, and enable 16% range increase, just form factor alone. Uh, yeah. So when, 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 these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. I, I just, I just to, to clarify that when we, when we see these um, plus six, sixteen percent or whatever the, uh, the percentage range increases, these are the amounts due just to that particular innovation. Yes. So we'll list a whole bunch of innovations, and then when you add them up, you get a total uh, improvement in uh, energy density and cost. Uh, but uh, th these numbers are are what refer to just this thing. Yeah, and I want to stress, this is not just a concept or a rendering. We are starting to ramp up manufacturing of these cells at our pilot 10 gigawatt hour production facility just around the corner. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's a video of uh, some of what's going on in the plant. Um, now, I mean, to, to be clear, it will take about a year to reach the 10 gigawatt hour capacity. Uh, so uh, this is important to appreciate. Like when you build a factory, there's a certain capacity that you design to, and then uh, it takes some period of time to actually achieve that capacity. So I would say it's probably about a year before we get to the 10 gigawatt hour annualized rate uh, with, the, uh, with the pilot plant. And this is just a pilot plant. Uh, the, the, the actual production plants will be more on the order of uh, you know, maybe 200 gigawatt hours, maybe more over time. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but let's stack up everything we just saw at the cell level. So just the cell form factor change enables a 14% dollar per kilowatt hour reduction. Just that cell form factor change. And now that you've been teased on this factory, we're going to go on and, and walk step by step through that factory. And, and discuss a series of, of innovations there. When thinking about the ideal cell factory, we have inspirations uh, behind us in the paper and bottling industry, where from humble beginnings, over a century of innovation has enabled mass scale, continuous motion, unbelievably low manufacturing cost. And when we think about the lithium ion industry, which is really only in its third decade of high volume production, it has so far to go to, to achieve similar scale and simplicity. And that, that was the inspiration that we set out to the team as we thought about how to marry cell design and manufacturing in the best possible factory. And let's talk a little bit about what's in a cell factory. First, there's an electrode process where the active materials are coated into films, onto foils. Um, then those foil coated foils are wound in the, in the winding process we just talked about, where if you do have tabs, you have to start and stop a lot. Um, then the, the jelly roll is assembled into the can, sealed, uh, filled with electrolyte, and then sent to formation, where the cell is charged for the first time, and, and where the sort of the electrochemistry is set and the quality of the cell is verified. And we set out at every step of this process to try to take that inspiration we just shaw showed and, and think about how we make those processes fundamentally better and more scalable. And one of the most important processes is where it all begins, the wet process of the, uh, of the electrode coating. And I, just to give you all a sense of scale, I'm going to walk through what's in that wet process. You've got mixing where the, the powders are mixed with either a water or a solvent, solvents for, for the cathode. Um, that Mix then goes into a large coat and dry oven where the slurry is coated onto the foil. You know, huge ovens, tens of meters long. 
dried, uh, and that solvent then has to be recovered. You can see the solvent recovery system. And then finally, the coated foil is compressed to the final density. And when you're looking at this, you're like, wow, that's a lot of equipment for one step, especially when you consider that little speck next to the coating oven is a person. This is serious, serious iron involved in making batteries. Wouldn't it be great if we could skip that solvent step, which is one of those dig a ditch and then fill it kind of things where you put the solvent in and then take it out and recycle it, and just go straight to dr uh, uh, dry mix to coat. And that's what the dry process really is about. And in the most basic form, you can see it here on a bench top. Literally, powder in, into film. As simple as that. I mean, it's hard, actually, uh, just to be clear. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, if, if this was easy, everyone would do it. So the, it's not like a uh, dry coating electrode is, is actually uh, easy. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it's actually very hard to do what appears to be a simple thing. Um, and and it's, it's worth noting, like, um, you know, we did acquire Maxwell. as like a little over a year ago, I guess. Um, and, you know, it's, it's certainly a good company and everything, but the, the, the dry coating they had was like, it's, it's like sort of, I would call proof of concept. Uh, since the acquisition, we've, we've actually uh, revved the, the machine that does dry coating four times. So we're in re revision four post-acquisition of the machine. Um, and there's still a lot of work to do. So I would not say this is like completely in the bag. It's still a lot of work to do. Um, and you know, as you, go, as you scale, go from like bench top to lab to uh, pilot to volume production, uh, there are actually major issues that you encounter at, at every level. It's not like you know, you, you make something work on your on your bench, and bingo! Now you can make a bazillion of, of it. It's, Absolutely, it's insanely difficult to scale up. Um, yeah, and, and, but and, uh, yeah, but if you do scale it up, yeah, what what you saw before becomes this. Yeah, so you can see the motivation: a ten times reduction in footprint, a ten times reduction in energy, and a massive reduction in investment. Um, but as Elon was saying, simple is hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I would like to not say that we, right now it's just totally working. It's, it's, it's close to working, <laughs> but it's not, even now, it, at the pilot plant level, it is close to working. Well, I, I can't, I, it's fair to say it probably, it does work, but with not a good, not a high yield. Yeah, so, we're, we're still ironing out the kinks, but we've made tens of thousands yeah. of cells, thousands of kilometers sure. of electrode. I mean, we are on the fourth generation of the equipment, so we've learned a lot along the, along the way. Yeah. I mean, it is super demanding because every atom has its place if you want to deliver the energy density and the cycle life and the supercharging. Yeah. But we're, but we're, we're confident that we will get there, but it yeah. will be a lot of work along the way. There's a clear path to success, but a ton of work between here and there. Yeah. So, uh, but this is a, a really profound improvement. Again, for people that know battery uh, manufacturing, this is, a, this is gigantic. Um, We'll probably be on, on machine revision six or seven by the time we do large scale production. Um, the, the rate at which the machines are being improved is, is extremely rapid. Like literally every three or four months is a new rev. Yeah, and beyond the electrode, we, we continue to innovate on every other process step. So let's talk a little bit about uh, assembly, which is next. The key to a high performing assembly line is Accomplishing processes while in motion, continuous motion, uh, and uh, thinking of the line as a highway, max velocity down the highway, no start yeah. and stop, no city driving. Exactly, no st stop lights and traffic lights or anything. You want the highway. You want the highway. Yeah. And together with our internal design team that makes this equipment and designs this equipment, we coupled thinking about how to make the best cell with thinking about how to make the best equipment so that we could accomplish the fastest parts per minute rates on all of these tools. Um, and through all of that development, we were able to get to the point where we can uh, implement assembly lines, one line, 20 gigawatt hours, seven times increase in output per line. And when you're thinking about scalability mm -hmm. and pure effort, having one line be seven X the capability is just effort multiplying. Yeah. So. Yeah, if you can sort of think about like the, the sort of the fundamental physics of a factory or something like um, I think it's actually quite a lot like the rocket equation uh, where uh, you've got basically in the rocket equation you've got your exhaust velocity and then the uh, log of the start uh, end masses. So it's basically saying 
you know, how fast are things going and what percentage of your, the factory volume is doing useful work. And conveyance does not count as useful work. So um, Only the value added steps. Yeah, if you, if you break the factory down into uh, cubic meter sections um, and say, uh, or, or smaller, it could be like one, you know, one liter sections, and say, uh, is a majority of, of this volume doing useful work? You would be astounded at how bad most factories are. They're like maybe two or three percent, including our factory in Fremont. Um, so I, I think it, it's possible to get to at least uh, 10 times that uh, uh, volumetric efficiency. Uh, so more like, you know, 30 percent uh, ish, maybe more. Um, and be 10x better, it, it, which means the factory can be 10 times smaller. Um, and then the other thing is how fast are things going through, through the factory? It's like speed and density. Um, the, the, fa the faster you go, like if a factory that's moving at say twice the speed of another factory is equivalent to two, two factories, basically. And the, the company that will be successful uh, is the co company that with one factory can accomplish what other companies take two or three or four factories to do. So. This is what we're trying to do here is, is say, okay, how do we, uh, with, with, a f with one factory, achieve what maybe five or even ten factories would normally be required to achieve? And, and the vertical integration with the machine design teams at, you know, Groman and, 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 and Highbar and others allows us to really accomplish that because we don't have all these edge conditions between one piece of equipment and another. We can design the entire machine to be one machine and remove all of these unnecessary steps. Yeah, uh, I mean, t basically Tesla uh, is, is aiming to be the, the best at manufacturing of any company on Earth. Uh, this is the thing that's actually most important in the long run. I think, um, you know, just from a company standpoint and, and from basically um, achieving sustainability as fast as possible, uh, but I think also for long-term competitiveness, um, eventually every, every car company will have long-range electric cars. Um, I, you know, eventually every company will have autonomy. I think, but not every company will be uh, great at, at manufacturing. Uh, Tesla will be absolutely head and shoulders above anyone else in manufacturing. That is our goal. <laughs> <laughs> manufacturing is hard, and hard problems are fun to yeah. solve. Um, OK, now let's talk about formation. In a, in a typical cell factory, formation represents 25% of the investment. And what is formation? It's, it's charging and discharging cells and verifying the quality of the cell. Turns out we've charged and discharged billions and billions of cells in our vehicles, so we know a thing or two about that. The typical formation setup is you charge and discharge each cell individually. In our car, we charge thousands of cells at once. And we took our principal and our power electronics, leveraging p power wall, vehicle battery management systems, and others to dramatically improve the, the formation equipment uh, cost effectiveness and density. 86% reduction in formation investment, 75% reduction in footprint. So. You want to take this one? Uh, sure. So essentially what this translates to, based on what we know today, is about a 75% reduction uh, in the investment per kilowatt hour uh, or gigawatt hour. It's, it's just a... Uh, basically four times better than the current state of the art to the best of our knowledge. Uh, and uh, I think there's probably room to improve even beyond that. Definitely. Uh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we're able to, from a volume standpoint, actually get what, um, in, in a smaller form factor than Giga Nevada, uh, we were able to get uh, many times the, the, the uh, cell output. So. Uh, you can see, like, basically, we can get a terawatt hour in, le in less space than it took to make a gigawatt hour, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, 150 gigawatt hours. So this is pretty profound. You know, it's like I would actually not have thought this was possible uh, several years ago, um, that we could actually get to terawatt hour scale in less, in less space than uh, what we, we currently envision for doing 150 gigawatt hours. So yes, simpler accelerates terawatt hour scale, and that's what we need to do to accelerate our mission. Um, and, you know, as Elon said, we're going to try to even improve on this as we uh, push towards our goals, which are? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, this, this is just for, uh, this is just talking about uh, Tesla internal cell production. Um, as I tweeted out earlier, we will continue to uh, use our cell suppliers, uh, Panasonic and uh, LG and CATL. Um, and so this is 100 gigawatt hours supplemental to 
uh, what we buy from suppliers. Um, and uh, yeah, essentially, th this this does like reduce our weighted average cost of a sale because, uh, but it, but it does it allows us to make a lot more cars and a lot more stationary storage. Um, and um, and then long term, we're uh, expecting to make on the order of uh, three thousand gigawatt hours or or three terawatt hours per year. Um, I think we can. Yeah, well, I think we've got a good chance of, of achieving this actually before 2030, but I, I'm highly confident that we could do it by, by 2030. When you look at the size of that factory on the previous page, it really shows how enabling all of these advancements are in achieving a three terawatt hour goal by 2030. And not only is all of that manufacturing innovation fantastic for enabling scale, it's also an additional 18% reduction in dollar per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so we have a manufacturing system. We've got a cell design. What are the active materials we're going to put in that cell design? Let's talk about the anode first. Let's talk about silicon. Why is silicon awesome? It's awesome because it's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust after oxygen, which means it's everywhere. It's sand. Yeah. Um, sand is silicon dioxide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it happens to store nine times more lithium than graphite, which is the typical and a material in, in lithium ion batteries today. So why isn't everybody using it? The re main reason is because the challenge with silicon is that it expands 4x when fully charged with lithium. And basically all, all of that expansion stress on the particle, the particles start cracking, they start electrically isolating, you lose capacity, the energy retention of the battery starts to fade, and it, it also gums up with a passivation layer that has to keep reforming as the particles expand. Yeah, basically, with, with silicon, the cookie crumbles and gets gooey. <laughs> That's basically what happens. Good analogy. Yeah. Um, and current approaches to solve this, which exist, I mean, we have silicon in, in the cars that you're all in right now, are involved highly engineered, expensive materials uh, in, in the scheme of things. Now, they're still great, and they enable some of the benefits of silicon. They just don't enable all of it, and they're not scalable enough. And you can see some of the things that, that maybe you've heard of, SIO, silicon with, with carbon or silicon nanowires. I mean, that's kind of the space right now. What we're proposing is a step change in capability and a, and a step change in cost. And what that really is, is to just go to the raw metallurgical silicon itself. Don't engineer the base metal. Just start with that and design for it to expand in how you think of the, the particle in the electro design and, and how you, you code it. Yeah, I'm not sure if you saw this, basically a dollar uh, per kilowatt hours. Yep. Um, th th basically, if, if, you, if, you, if you use simple silicon, it's dramatically less than even the silicon that is currently used in the batteries that are made today. Um, and you can use a lot more of it. The anode would cost, yeah, with this silicon, and the anode costs a dollar and 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, yeah. Um, and how does it work? Start with raw metallurgical silicon, stabilize the surface with an elastic ion conducting polymer coating that is uh, applied through a very scalable approach. Um, no, no, no like chemical vapor deposition, no highly engineered high, high capex solutions. And then integrated in the electrode through a robust network formed out of a highly elastic binder. Um, and in the end, by leveraging this silicon to its potential, we can increase the range of our vehicles by an additional 20%, just this uh, improvement. Yeah, it gets cheaper and longer range. Yeah, and, and when we take that anode cost reduction, we're looking at another 5% dollar per kilo, kilowatt hour reduction at the battery pack level. And there's more. <laughs> Let's talk about cathodes. What is a battery cathode? Cathodes are like bookshelves where the metal, you know, the nickel, the cobalt, the manganese, or aluminum is like the shelf, and the lithium is the book. And really, what sets apart these different metals is how many books of lithium they can fit on the shelves and how sturdy the shelves are. Cobalt uh, is a pr pr Yeah, sorry, I, I was going to say, like, it, it's, it's tough to exactly figure out what the right analogy is to explain uh, cathode and, and anode, but a bookshelf is probably a pretty good one um, in the sense that um, y you, need, you need a stable structure uh, to contain the ions. Um, so you want a structure that does not uh, crumble or get gooey or basically that, that holds its shape in both the cathode and the anode. Uh, as you're moving these ions, ions back and forth, uh, you, you, it needs to retain its structure. Uh, so 
uh, if it doesn't retain its structure, then you lose cycle life and your battery capacity drops very quickly. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. And and I think people are always talking about like, oh, what's the cathode going to be? Is it NCA or whatever? You know, the thing to consider is just fundamentally what the nickel, the the, the metals are capable of, and that's what we have on the chart here: dollar per kilowatt hour cathode of just the metal, using just LME, you know, London Metal Exchange prices, um, versus the energy density of just the cathode. And you can see nickel is the cheapest and the highest energy density, and that's why. Increasing nickel is a goal of ours and really everybody's in the energy and in, in the uh, battery industry. Um, but one of the reasons why cobalt is even used at all is because it is a very stable bookshelf. And the challenge with going to pure nickel is stabilizing that bookshelf with only nickel. And that's what we've been working on with our high nickel co cathode development, which has zero cobalt in it, leveraging novel coatings and dop novel coatings and dopants. Uh, we can get a 15% reduction in cathode dollar per kilowatt hour. Yeah. <laughs> Big deal. But it's not just about nickel. You want to? Yeah, sure. Um, so in, in order to scale, uh, we really need to make sure that we're not constrained by total nickel availability. Um, I actually spoke with uh, the CEOs of the biggest mining companies in the world and said, w uh, please make more nickel. <laughs> it's very important. Um, and so th I think they are going to make more nickel. Uh, but uh, I, there's also, uh, you know, uh, I think we need to have a, a, a kind of a three-tiered approach to, to batteries. Um, so starting with iron, that's kind of like a medium range. And then nickel manganese as sort of a medium plus uh, uh, intermediate. Um, and then a high nickel for long range applications like Cybertruck and uh, the semi. Um, something like a, like a semi truck, it's extremely important to have a uh, high energy density uh, in order to get long range. So. Um, and and uh, just to give sort of iron a, a bit um, more time, like the, uh, although the, you know, if you look at the uh, white ounce per kilogram uh, at the cathode level of, um, of iron, uh, it looks like nickel is twice as good. Uh, but when you've w fully considered at the pack level everything else taken into account, uh, nickel is about maybe 50 or 60 percent better than, uh, uh, than iron. So I iron is not a is little better than it would seem. When you t when you look at it at the uh, the pack level fully considered, um, it's still, it's not as good as nickel. Nickel is like 50 to 60 percent better, uh, but it's still pr it's actually pretty good. Um, and so you know, uh, g good for stationary storage and for uh, medium range applications uh, where energy density is not paramount. And then, like I said, for intermediate, uh, it's kind of a nickel manganese, um, and it's uh, relatively straightforward to do a cathode that's uh, two thirds nickel, one third manganese. Uh, which would then allow uh, us to make 50% more uh, cell volume uh, with the same amount of nickel. And with very little energy trade-off. I mean, yeah. just enough to, to, to have you still want to use 100% nickel for something like a, a semi-truck, but, but really not much of a sacrifice at all. Yeah. Um, and, you know, beyond the metals, because a lot of people spend time talking about the metals, actually the cathode process itself is a big target. 35% of the cathode dollar per kilowatt hour is just in mo transferring it into its final form. And so we see that as a big target, and we, we decided to take that on. Um, here's a view of the traditional cathode process. Effectively, uh -huh. if you start at the left and you have the metal from the, the mine, the first thing that happens is the metal from the mine is changed into an intermediate thing called a metal sulfate, because that's just happened to be what chemists wanted a long time ago. And then, you, and then when you're making the cathode, you have to take this intermediate thing called metal sulfate, add chemicals, add a whole bunch of water, a whole bunch of stuff happens in the middle, and at the end, you get that little bit of cathode and a whole bunch of wastewater and byproducts. Yeah, it's, it's insanely complicated. Uh, if, you, if you look at the total, like if you're just like, you know, it's a small world journey of uh, I am a nickel atom, what happens to me? And it's like, it's crazy. Like you're going around the world three times, it's, there's like, the moral equivalent of like digging the ditch, filling the ditch, and digging the ditch again. <laughs> uh, it's total madness, basically. Um, and these things just grew up as just a, they're just kind of like legacy things that uh, it's like how it was done before. And then they connected the dots, uh, but really didn't think of the whole thing from like a first principle standpoint, saying how do we get from uh, the nickel ore in the ground to the finished nickel product for a battery. Uh, and so we've, we've looked at the entire value chain and said, how can we make this as simple as possible? And that's what we're proposing here with our process. As you can see, 
a whole, less, a whole lot less is going on here. We get rid of the intermediate, metal water, final pro product cathode, recirculate the water, no wastewater at all. And when you summarize all of that, it's the 66% reduction in CapEx investment, a 76 reduction in process cost, and zero wastewater. Much more scalable solution. Yeah. And then when you think about the fact that now we're actually just directly consuming the raw metal nickel powder, it dramatically simplifies the metal refining part of the whole process. So we can eliminate billions in battery grade nickel intermediate production. It's not needed at all. Yeah. Um, and uh, we can also use that same process we showed on the previous page to directly consume the metal powder coming out of recycled electric vehicle and grid storage batteries. So this process enables both simpler mining and simpler recycling. Um, and now that we have this process, obviously we're going to go and start building our own cathode facility in North America and leveraging all of the North American resources that exist for nickel and lithium. And just doing that, just localizing our cathode supply chain and production, we can reduce miles traveled by all the materials that end up in the cathode by 80%, which is huge for cost. Yeah, I mean, c c to be clear, cathode production would be part of our the, te the Tesla cell production plant. So it would just be, you know, basically, you know, uh, raw materials coming from the mine, and uh, from raw materials in the mine, out comes a battery. And on that note, the way the lithium ends up in the cell is through the cathode, so then we should obviously on-site lithium conversion as well, which is what we will do using a new process that we're going to pioneer. That's a sulfate-free process again, skip the intermediate. 33% um, reduction in lithium cost, 100% electric facility co-located with the cathode plant. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's important to note that there is a massive amount of lithium on Earth. Um, yeah. So uh, lithium is not like oil. There's a, a massive amount of it pretty much everywhere. Um, so uh, in fact, there's, there's enough um, lithium in the United States to convert the entire United States fleet to electric. It's like the, all the cars in the United States, all, there's like 300 million or something like that. Uh, e every vehicle in the United States can be converted to electric using only lithium that is available in the United States. Discovered today. Well, that, yeah, what we already know is exists. People really there's, haven't even been looking. Yeah, people haven't even been, been trying because it's just like widely available. So, yeah. um, uh, but it, it is important to say like, okay, what is the smartest way to uh, take the ore and uh, extract the lithium and, and do so in an environmentally friendly way? Um, and w we actually discovered a, again, looking at a sort of first principles physics standpoint, um, in, instead of just the way it's always been done, um, is w we found that uh, we can actually use table salt, uh, sodium chloride, uh, to uh, basically ex extract the lithium from the ore. Um, and uh, th this is, nobody's done this before. I, to the best of my knowledge, nobody's done this. Um, and it's a, a, a sort of, you know, all the elements are reusable. It's a, a very sustainable way of, of obtaining lithium. Um, and we actually, uh, uh, we, 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 we actually got uh, rights to a, a lithium clay deposit in Nevada. Over um, 10,000 acres. Over 10,000 acres. Um, and then the, the nature of the mining is actually, I think, also very environmentally uh, sensitive in that we, we, we sort of take a chunk of dirt out of the ground, or remove the lithium, and then put the chunk of dirt back where it was. So it will look pretty much the same as before, uh, and it will not look like terrible, and yeah, it will be nice. <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> so Simply mix clay with salt, put it in water, salt comes out with the lithium, done. I yeah, mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're really excited about this, and, and there really is enough lithium in Nevada alone to electrify the entire U.S. fleet. Yeah, I guess that's true. Actually, just what's in Nevada. That's, uh, that's basically so much damn lithium on Earth, it's crazy. <laughs> um, it's one of the most common elements on the planet. Um, and eventually, as we said at the beginning, when we get to this steady state 20 terawatt hours per year of production, we will tr transfer the entire non-renewable fleet of both power plants, home heating and, 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 batter and, and industry heating, and, v and vehicles to electric. And at that point, we have an awesome resource in those batteries to recycle to make new batteries. So we don't need to do any more mining at that point. And you can see why. Yeah. R r the, the, the difference in the, the value of the, of the material coming back from the vehicle versus the ground, you'd always go to the vehicle. And we recycle 100% of our vehicle batteries today. And actually, we are starting our pilot 
full-scale recycling production uh, at Gigafactory Reno next quarter to, to continue to develop this process as, as our recycling returns grow. Yeah, I mean, to date it's been done by third parties, but uh, we think we can, we can recycle the, the batteries more effectively, especially since, uh, you know, we, we know our batteries, we're making the same battery as the thing we're recycling. So uh, whereas, like, third-party recyclers have to consider batteries of all kinds. Yeah, and, and, and just to think about what this actually means, the recycling resource is always 10 or greater years delayed because batteries last a really long time. But eventually, it is the way that, that all resources will be made, made available, and that's why we're investing in this recycling facility at, in Nevada. Yeah. Long-term, new batteries will come from old batteries uh, once the fleet reaches steady state. Right. Okay, so we just talked about scaling cathode and recycling. All of the benefits that you just saw are added to this benefit of a 12% reduction in dollars per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level. Almost at our have the cost goal, but there's one more section. Take it away, Elon. Oh, so um, I mean, there's an architecture that um, we've been wanting to do at Tesla for a long time, uh, and we're finally we finally figured it out. <laughs> um, and I think it's it's the way that all electric cars in the future will ultimately be made. Uh, it's the right way to, right way to do things. Um, so it's, it starts with uh, having a single piece casting or a single piece casting for the front body and the rear body. Um, and uh, in order to do this, we uh, commissioned the, the largest casting machine that has ever been made. And it's currently working just uh, over the road at our uh, F Fremont plant. Uh, we have the, the, the it's pretty sweet. Um, ma making the uh, entire, currently making the entire uh, rear section of the car in a, as a single piece high pressure die cast aluminum. Um, and in order to do this, we actually uh, had to develop our own alloy uh, because we wanted a high strength casting alloy that not, did not require coatings or heat treatment. Uh, this is a big deal for, for castings, especially with a, la a large casting. If you heat treat it afterwards, it, it tends to deform. It kind of like does this like potato chip thing. So it's very hard to keep a large casting uh, to have its shape. Um, so in order to achieve this, th there was no alloy that existed that could do this. So we developed our own alloy, a special alloy of aluminum that has high strength without heat treat and, and is very castable. Uh, so that's a you know a, a great achievement of our materials team. Um, in fact, in general, we've got a lot of advanced materials coming for for Tesla that uh, new alloys and, and materials that have never existed before. So. Uh, so you're basically making this, the, the, the front and rear of the car as a single piece. Um, and then that, that, that then inter the interfaces to uh, what we call the, the structural battery, where the battery for the first time will have dual use. Uh, the battery will both have the use as an energy device and as structure. This, this is absolutely the way things are done. In, in the early days of, of aircraft, they would carry the fuel tanks as cargo. So the, the fuel tanks um, actually had, were quite difficult to, to carry. They were like basically worse than cargo. You had to, had to kind of bolt them down. Um, it was very difficult. Uh, and then somebody said, hey, what if we just make the wing tanks, uh, what, what if we just make the fuel tank in wing shape? So uh, all modern airplanes, the fuel tank, your, your wing is just a, a, a fuel tank in wing shape. This is absolutely the way to do it. Um, and then the, the, the fuel tank serves as dual structure, um, and it's, not, it's no longer cargo. It's, it's fundamental to the structure of the aircraft. This was a major breakthrough. Um, we're doing the same for cars. So, so, so this is really quite profound. Uh, the, effectively, the, the non-cell portion of the battery has negative mass. So it, we, we save so much mass in the rest of the vehicle. We, we save more mass in the rest of the vehicle than the non-cell portion of the battery. So it's like, well, how, how do you really minimize the mass of a battery? Make it negative. Make the battery non-cell portion of the battery pack negative. Um, so um, it, it also allows us to pack the cells more densely because we do not have uh, intermediate structure in the battery pack. So instead of having these, like, uh, supports and stabilizers and stringers and structural elements in the battery, we now have a lot more space in the battery because the pack itself is structural. Um, the, uh, what we do is essentially, um, like, what we, like 
we, instead of having just um, a filler that is a flame retardant, which is currently what is, is in the 3NY battery packs, we have a filler that is a, a structural adhesive um, as well as flame retardant. So it effectively glues the cells to the top and bottom sheet. And this allows you to do shear transfer between the upper and lower sheet. Just like uh, if you have like a Formula One uh, craft or like a, a racing boat, and you have uh, carbon fiber face sheets and say aluminum honeycomb between them. Uh, this uh, gives you incredible stiffness, um, and it's really the way that, that any super fast thing works is uh, you, you you create a um, basically a, a, a honeycomb sandwich with with two f uh, face sheets. Uh, this is actually even better than what aircraft do because aircraft do not do this. Um, they, they can't do this because fuel is liquid. So <laughs> in our case, the batteries are solid. So. We can actually use the, sh the, the steel shell case of the battery to transfer uh, sh uh, shear from the upper and lower face sheet, which makes for an incredibly stiff structure, even stiffer than a regular car. Yeah. In, in fact, if this was, if, if this was an, in a, uh, in a, uh, like a, a convertible uh, that had no upper structure, it would be stiffer than, that convertible would be stiffer than a regular car. So this is, it's just really, to ha ha it's a pro really major. Um, so it improves the mass efficiency of the battery, um, and then the, those castings are also quite important because you want to transfer load into the structural battery pack uh, in a very smooth, continuous way, um, so you don't um, put uh, arbitrary point loads into the battery. Um, so you, you kind of have to, you, you want to sort of feather the load out from the front and rear uh, into the structural battery. Um, it also allows us to uh, use uh, to, to move the, the cells uh, closer to the center of the of the car. Um, because we don't have the, 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 in the top one, we've got that sort of all the supports and stuff. So the, the volumetric efficiency of the structural pack is, is much better than a non-structural pack. And we actually bring the cells closer to the center. Um, and uh, because they're closer to the center, the, uh, it reduces the probability of, uh, of a side impact uh, potentially contacting the cells. Because they have, it has to go, in, any kind of side impact has to go further in order to reach the cells. Uh, it also proves... Uh, what's called the polar moment of inertia, uh, which is that uh, you can think of like when there's a like a ice skater uh, arms out or arms in. Arms in, you rotate faster. So if you can uh, bring things closer to the center, you reduce the polar moment of inertia, and that means you can you, the car maneuvers better. It just feels better. You don't want to know why, but it just it just feels more agile. So it, it's it's really cool. This is really major. Um, like I said, it's, so 10 percent mass reduction in, in the body of the car. 14% range increase, uh, 370 fewer parts. So, I mean, I, I really think that, that long term, in any cars that do not uh, take this architecture will not be competitive. And it's not just at the product level a better product, um, but in the factory, it's a massive simplification. You saw the part removal, um, you know, it's casting machines, it's the structural battery pack. So we're looking at over 50% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour, 35% reduction in floor space, and we'll continue to improve that as we make the vehicle factory of the future. Yeah, so it's major improvements on, on all fronts from the cell all the way to the, the vehicle. Um, and in addition to the improvements we just said on enabling additional range and improving the structural performance of the vehicle, it is worth another 7% dollar per kilowatt hour reduction at the battery pack level, bringing our total reductions now to 56% dollars per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so stacking it up. We're not just talking about uh, cost or range. We've got to look at all the facets. So range increase, we're unlocking up to 54% increase in range for our vehicles and energy density for our energy products. 56% uh, reduction in dollars per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level, and a 69% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour, which is the true enabler when we talk back about how do we achieve this scale problem here. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, so um, I think it's pretty nice that investment per kilowatt per gigawatt hour reduction is 69%. I mean, who would have thought? Yeah. <laughs> Just happened to happen <laughs> out that way. Yeah. I mean, 0.420%, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so w w what, what this res uh, enables uh, us to do is achieve a new trajectory in the reduction of, of uh, 
sell cost. And um, now, to, to be clear, it will take us probably a year to 18 months to start realizing these, uh, these advantages. And probably to fully realize the advantages, probably it's about three years or thereabouts. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's not like uh, if we could do this instantly, we would. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's really, um, I think what this bodes, it just really bodes well for the future and means that the long-term scaling of, of Tesla and, and, and uh, the sustainable energy products that we make will be uh, massively increased. So, uh, you know, what tends to happen as companies get bigger is things tend to slow down. Um, well, actually, they're going to speed up. And they have to speed up if we're going to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. Yeah. I mean, long term, we, you know, we want to try to uh, replace about you know, uh, at least 1% of the total vehicle fleet on Earth, which is about 2 billion vehicles. So long term, we want to try to make about 20 million vehicles a year. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important to point out that when we talked about three terawatt hours by 2030, the problem is a 20 terawatt hour problem. So everybody needs to be uh, accelerating their efforts to accomplish these objectives. Doesn't matter where you are in the value chain, there is a ton to do. You need to rethink from first principles how you do it so that you can scale to meet all of our objectives. Yep. And Elon? Uh, sure. What does this mean? Uh, what, does it mean for, what, does this, what does this mean for our future products? Uh, so, uh, we, you know, we're, we're confident that long term we can design and, and manufacture a, a, a compelling $25,000 electric vehicle. Um, so, you, you know, this, this, uh, this has always been our dream from the beginning of the company. I even like wrote a blog piece about it um, because, um, you know, our first car was, was an expensive sports car and, and then, it was, then it was like slightly less expensive sedan and then finally it's sort of a I don't know, mass market premium, but, uh, you know, like the Model 3 and Model Y. Um, but it really it was always our goal to try to make an affordable electric car. And um, I think probably, uh, w w yeah, like I said, about, about three years from now, uh, we're confident we can make a very, com uh, uh, very compelling $25,000 electric vehicle uh, that's also fully autonomous. And when you think about the $25,000 price point, you have to consider how much, in it, how much less expensive it is to own electric vehicle yeah so yeah. actually it, it's it, it becomes even more affordable at that twenty five thousand dollar price point yeah so we have uh, and extreme performance and range um, and uh, we should probably talk about uh, the you know model s plaid you know what about that <laughs> Yeah. Woo. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, we we, we took the la latest plat out to Laguna Seca on Sunday. It got um, a minute thirty, um, and uh, we think probably there's another three seconds or more to take off that time. Uh, so uh, we're confident the Model S plat will achieve the uh, the best track time of any production vehicle ever, of any kind, two door or otherwise. Um, and you can order it now, uh, and it's uh, <laughs> available uh, uh, basically end of next year. So, and now we'll move to Q and A. Absolutely. So we'll invite we'll invite a few people on stage. Come on up, team. This is just a small portion of the team, but uh, it would be great to you know show you some more of the team. And um, and we, when we do Q and A, we can like. You know, give, give various people different uh, questions to answer. Sounds great. <laughs> actually, I don't know how we're getting the questions. Uh, actually, I don't know either. Uh, is somebody going to read them? Okay, well, you could just like, y y you can maybe get out of the car for two seconds and, and yell it at us. I don't know. Hey, how do we get any the questions? Oh, there are mics. Okay, wait for oh, the mic. Oh, there are mics. Okay, great, great. All right. 
<laughs> okay, we'll definitely need to give people mics because otherwise, there's no way. Um, sorry? Okay. All right, we're going to pass some mics out. Uh, we don't have a name for the $25,000 car yet. It's a great question, though. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, we will be manufacturing uh, cells in, in Berlin. Yep. Thermal management system? For homes. Oh, oh, you mean like the home HVAC? Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's a pet project that I'd love to get going on. Um, I don't know, maybe we'll start, start working on that next year. Because um, I just think this, man, you could really make a way better home HVAC system that's really quiet and super efficient and... Uh, yeah, super energy efficient, and also has like a you know a way better filter uh, you know for particles, and um, uh, yeah, just and, and it works uh, very reliably. And and there, we've already developed that for the car. Like so, the the heat pump uh, in the Model Y uh, is really pretty spectacular. Uh, I mean, it's tiny, it's efficient, it it has to last for 15 years. Uh, it's got to work in all kinds of conditions from, from you know, the coldest winter to the hottest summer. Um, so we've actually already done a massive amount of the work necessary for uh, a really kick-ass home HVAC. Um, and they can also, like, stack them. So if you want to, say, uh, depending upon the size of your house or whatever, how much you need, you can just, you can just basically stack them um, and uh, just have a very compelling, super efficient home HVAC. And then you can also uh, communicate with the car, and it'll, it'll know when you're coming home. So it's like, oh, I, I don't need to keep the house cold all day. I just you know, keep, cool it down because I knew you were coming home. Um, so the, the pack can communicate with the car and just like really dial it into when you actually need cooling and heating. It'd be great. Fun product. Yeah. Who's next? Hello. Hey guys, Eli here uh, from Tesla Owners Club, My Tesla Adventure. Uh, just quick question. So I'm a huge fan of car camping in my Tesla with my dream case, like my all time favorite activity. Is it going to be possible to get climate control to the back of the Cybertruck? Because that would be the ultimate <laughs> camping machine if we can get all night climate control. Uh, we'll try to do that. Thank yeah. You. I agree. That would be, that'd be really cool. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Who's next? Hello. Yeah. Uh, long time fan. Long, uh, great guy. Uh, just a question. How does the ice industry look like for uh, in the future? Uh, well, I don't think there will be an ice industry long term. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I guess there might be like a few things that are like it's a like curious thing. Like, I mean, I'm pr there's still like some steam engines made somewhere, uh, but like they're just basically sort of quirky collector's items. And, I mean, that will be the future of the internal combustion engine car. Hi, Elon, to your left here in the white Model Y. Ryan McCaffrey from the, from the Ride the Lightning Tesla podcast. Uh, curious about Cybertruck. It was interesting to see where you had it in on the battery technology front. I'm sort of curious what you see for it in the production front. Is its volume, you know, trucks are so popular in America. Do you see its volume equaling the three or the Y in the future? And also, is the, uh, did you, did, were you able to get Tesla is able to legally be sold in Texas as part of the Giga Texas deal. <laughs> um, well, it's hard to say what the volume exactly would be for the Cybertruck. The, the orders are gigantic. So and we have like, I don't know, well over half a million orders. Of, I think maybe six or 600,000. That's a lot, basically. We stopped counting. Um, so I, I think there's probably room for, I don't know, at least like a unit volume of like, 250 to 300,000 a year, maybe more. Um, so uh, now we are designing the Cybertruck to meet the American spec, because if you try to design a, a car to meet the global, the, the, the super set of all global re requirements, it basically, you can't make the Cybertruck. It's impossible. Um, so uh, it it's really is designed for the American market. But this is the biggest market. The North American market is the biggest market for pickup trucks by far, or l large pickup trucks. And then I think for uh, in, we'll probably make an international version of, of the Cybertruck that'll be kind of smaller, you know, kind of like a tight Wolverine package. Um, it'll still be cooler, but it'll be, it'll be smaller because you just can't make a giant truck like that for most markets. Um, 
So yeah, but it's going to be great. Uh, and I, I'm, I don't know. I think probably we'll be able to sell directly in Texas. Um, we do pretty well right now, uh, but it, it is a bit weird not being able to actually conclude a transaction in Texas. But it, it's got to be like you know a click on a server based in California. <laughs> so, um, but weirdly, we can do leasing in Texas, but not s selling. But I, I, hopefully, that'll get cleared up in the future. Yeah, Elon. Uh Great job with everything that you're doing. Thros Gerber from Gerber Kawasaki. Uh, your team's amazing. What I'm most curious about, these innovations are incredible, but on my drive up here, fully on autopilot for 400 miles, the entire state is brown. And this is ultimately about climate. Has there been some analysis done if all these things are achieved? What will its direct impact be on climate? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, I think it will have a very significant impact because it will stop the um, the CO2 PPM from growing uh, as it is every year. Um, and I, I mean, I should say, like, you know, um, you know, I try to view the, the whole climate thing, for, you know, as a science question as much as possible. You know, science, you always you question your hypothesis. Is it true? Is it not true? Or assign a probability to a given hypothesis. And I should say that my, my original interest in electric vehicles uh, predates the climate issue. Um, like just when I was in high school, I was like, I thought, man, if, if we don't figure out electric cars, the whole economy is going to collapse when we run out of oil. So it's like, we better figure out electric cars uh, and sustainable energy or civilization is going to crumble. Um, and then uh, it was only kind of later that the uh, significance of the, the climate risk uh, became apparent. Um, and uh, we were also able, uh, using fracking and other types of technology, to access a lot more uh, fossil fuels than previously thought, um, which is, you know, uh, helpful for lowering the cost of gasoline, but it's pretty bad for uh, the total uh, tonnage of CO2 that you could put in the atmosphere. It's now greatly beyond what pe people previously thought. So, um, but, but this is, you know, as we were just going through this presentation, it's like it is a absolutely monumental task to accelerate uh, the advent of sustainable energy. Uh, I mean, the entire global economy is still, you know, n more than 99% dependent on, or quote, roughly 99% dependent on fossil fuels. Um, so although electric cars kind of get a lot of press right now, they, they, they're still, and, and there's still very few, as a percentage of the total global fleet is practically nothing. It's, I would say, yes, less than 1% of the global fleet is electric right now. Um, because you know, of two, two billion cars and trucks and whatnot in use. So, so there's a massive uh, amount of work ahead, just, in, just insane, like hard to comprehend how much work is ahead to uh, get the new vehicle production to be sustainable, uh, to um, massively increase the amount of stationary storage, which is critical because uh, renewable energy is, is intermittent. Uh, wind and solar is, is intermittent. Sometimes the wind doesn't blow, and, some, and this obviously the sun doesn't shine at night. So, you, you've got to have batteries, um, a massive, massive number of batteries. So it's, yeah, it's hard to measure in direct impact, but it's, it's an experiment that we shouldn't be performing. And the sooner we can sort yeah. of end the experiment, the sooner we can kind of move on in a fully sustainable way that is actually lower cost. I mean, I think the thing that people yeah. haven't fully internalized is once we do get to the 25K car, the ownership cost of that car is incredibly lower than the prior car. And then on the solar side and wind, with the cost of solar and wind coming down and with batteries coming down w with them, the actual cost of energy on the grid is going down. So we're, we're sort of moving to a, towards a sustainable lower cost future. So it, it, there's not really a sacrifice. Yeah, that's true. It, it is a false dichotomy to say that it's like it's either prosperity or sustainability. Uh, this is often used you know, by oil and gas to say like, oh, well, do you want people to lose their jobs? Do you want to have, do you want lower people's standards, standards of living? Do you want to, you know, make all these economic sacrifices uh, really in, in order to have sustainability? And the reality, as Drew was saying, uh, is that uh, a sustainable energy is going to be lower cost, not higher cost than uh, fossil fuels. Um, thank Elon, you quick question for you, um, right here in front. First, uh, thanks for having everyone and is telling a friend the one company to go work for that's going to have the biggest structural impact over the next 10 years at scale. It's probably Tesla. So kudos to everyone at Tesla for what they've done to this point and going forward. Um, 
But two questions for you. As you've looked at the auto and the storage markets, I know you've talked about it at kind of 50-50 long term, but it seems like a lot of the battery cost curve achievements that you're see that you've presented today really make some of these storage uh, opportunities much more feasible over the next five years. And so I guess the first part of the question is, does your calculus upon learning and improving these things change on that 50-50 mix, or is there a role where storage becomes bigger? And then the second part of the question, with, with all these huge grand visions, who's going to be with Tesla from a corporate perspective accomplishing these things? Obviously, Tesla can't do it alone. But when you look at some of the traditional auto industry or power, et cetera, I don't see a lot of other Teslas. Um, well, actually, so there's a lot of companies in China that I think are doing great work uh, with electric vehicles and uh, also with stationary storage. Um, although we don't see that much I in the U.S. yet, but I think probably we will in the future. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, obviously, we're doing everything we can to encourage uh, other companies to move to uh, sustainable transport um, and also, you know, m make stationary storage batteries. Um, you know, we opened up, o uh, made our patents freely available. Um, uh, you know, we really try to tell these companies, hey, you really need to do this or you won't exist in the future. Uh, but they don't believe it, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, we've, tr we've talked until we're blue in the face. Uh, <laughs> what, what are we supposed to do? Um, um, but we really are hopeful that other companies will also uh, do what we're doing and that will make the a sustainable future come sooner. From um, a fundamental market size perspective, like we, we did the first like ground up work to show the size of the of the market in terawatt hours, and they are roughly 50, 50, 10 terawatt hours for transportation, 10 terawatt hours for the grid. Um, and part of that is because yeah. the grid batteries, because when you're making a power plant, you're making a, a large investment, um, our 25-year assets are greater. Um, you know, if, if they were, if the grid batteries were 10-year kind of things, the grid bet market would be bigger. But because it's a longer duration asset, they're roughly the same size. Thinking long term, um, is there any other segments that this new battery will be able to disrupt or electrify? Um, beyond just yeah. the initial Model 2 or cheaper sedan, like a boat, boring company loop, plane, boat. Where are you, oh, Golly? Are you there? Good? What's up? Uh, right here. Okay, great. I mean, uh, man, yeah, it's, it's like, like, it's like ventriloquism here, you know. It's like, <laughs> uh, we just get the sound out of the speaker and you can't tell where the heck it's coming from. <laughs> yeah, a any hints or is the Model 2 such a big deal because it decreases the cost of transportation that that is really the disruption? Or should we get hyped that this new cost curve opens up different vehicle categories like a high passenger density bus, boring loop, boat, plane? Um, well, I, I mean, there's... There, there are batteries in limited production right now that do exceed 400 uh, watt hours per kilogram, which I think is about the number you need for uh, decent range, medium range uh, aircraft. Um, and uh, I think our batteries will, over time, start to approach the 400 watt hours per kilogram range as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think over time we'll see all modes of transport, uh, with the ironic exception of rockets. Uh, transition to sustainability, um, or to, to electric, basically. Um, on, the, on the rocket front, uh, what we're planning to do is, uh, like about 80% of Starship is, oxy is uh, liquid oxygen, um, and uh, we're actually already uh, run running a power line to be able to use wind power to create the liquid oxygen. So we're making you know, some decent progress on uh, s sustainability on the rocket front, but there's just no way to have an electric rocket, um, and it's important for the future of uh, life and consciousness that we become a multi-planet species. So i uh, got to keep doing that. Hi, Elon. Hello. Josh Phillips here, retail investor. I have a question in regards to the lithium and nickel industries and the likely price spikes and shortages of high-grade materials. The EV industry is likely to see if they don't act fast to address future supply. Tesla have clearly made the right moves that are necessary, but there's a real worry that the potential supply issues and price spikes will create a drag on the rest of the EV in industry and therefore a drag on global EV adoption. What advice would you give to the EV and mining industries to quickly solve this looming hurdles? Because for a sustainable energy future, the spice must flow. Thank you. Yeah, indeed, the spice must flow. The new spice. 
Um, I don't know. I think the, you know, the, the, I, it's, I'm not sure. I, I guess what, we, we can try to, like, basically uh, overdo it in cell production and perhaps supply cells to others. Um, but uh, we do see the fundamental, con fundamental constraint as total cell production. That's why we're putting so much effort into making cells um, and kind of reinventing, uh, trying to reinvent every aspect of cell production fr from uh, mining the ore to a, a complete battery pack um, because it's the fundamental constraint. It's, it's, no, we're not getting into the cell business because we, uh, you know, just for the hell of it, it's because it's the fundamental constraint. It's the thing that is uh, the limiting factor for uh, rapid growth. Um, but uh, we, we could certainly try to overdo it on cell, cell production and perhaps uh, sell cells to others. Um, although we are going at absolute top speed, so it's like, it's not like we're holding it back. Um, but I, I think like uh, just making really efficient cars and, uh, you know, that are, have low drag coefficient, um, low re loading resist low uh, rolling resistance, uh, efficient powertrains, um, I mean, that's kind of what we've done in order to make uh, iron phosphate uh, still have a, a, a good range. Um, so the iron phosphate phosphate's low, lower energy density uh, solution, but um, there's, um, you know, wh while there are some limitations on the total amount of nickel produced every year, there's really no limit on the iron. There's so much iron, it's ridiculous. So you can really scale up uh, iron phosphate, um, you know, f at a raw materials basis faster, more than you can nickel. Uh, but yeah, and just just to point out, you know, when we were walking through this presentation, we intentionally separated all the different aspects. The benefits of structural battery apply to a iron-based cathode in the same way they apply to a nickel-based cathode. Yeah. So you get longer-range uh, uh, iron-based vehicles, and also the silicon benefit can apply to the iron-based vehicles as well. So there's we can do a lot to extend the range of an iron-based vehicle, which is why it's a key part of the roadmap going forward. And then I invert, invited Turner up here to talk sure. about what the mining. Uh, industry can do. Yeah. Um, diversification on the cathode side is obviously massive, and EVs are all about efficiency. And so for the EV industry, for the vehicle industry, we need to see powertrain efficiency really increase at all other companies matching Tesla powertrain efficiency so that everyone can have that diversified cathode approach where LFP is used in medium range and, and even really make a 300-mile vehicle with LFP. Um, and really the goal that we were trying to present here was a model for vertical integration, strategic vertical integration that a lot of different people can do. What, what, what we need to see is vertical integration that shortens the, the process path from mine to cathode. And you know, what we're doing here is, is, is novel and we're, we're trying to push the industry in that direction. So you know, we're, we're presenting a model here that, that anyone can, can follow. Yeah, it, it, in fact, is there, if there's anything that, that you guys want to comment on, uh, feel free to s step forward and say something. I, I think the key is to be smart about your chemistry choices yeah, your materials to, choices. To talk louder. Yeah, th if you're smart about your materials choices, um, the spice will continue to flow. Yeah. You, don't, you don't need to use the same kind everywhere. And if you, it's about strategically planning it out. And, and for miners, I think we are incentivizing them quite a bit to ramp up their production. Yeah, and actually, we had good calls. Like they're all motivated. I think I think that they they've been sort of sitting back, being like, "Are you going to grow like crazy?" And we're like, "Yeah, we're going to grow like crazy." And then I think this indicates we're going to grow like crazy, and that's what the miners want to hear. And then they'll go make the investments. Hello, Elon. Uh, this is Ben Limpic. I'm a musician. I was wondering. Does Tesla have any um, future plans to make partnerships with music companies like it has done with Tencent Games or things like that for you guys to actually kind of expand your services um, for artists and other types of creative people to get involved in you know, producing content that can be part of the Tesla ecosystem or so other people that do creative things can get involved with you guys? Um, well, we don't. Uh we haven't really thought about that much, but it, I suppose it's probably something we should think about um, we will be providing a uh, title <laughs> on uh, Tesla's. Um, so, you know, we're providing, you know, music, more music sources uh, that people can choose from and uh, just try generally trying to improve the entertainment experience in the cars. Um, and I think, actually, as, as we go to a more autonomous future, uh, 
the, the importance of entertainment um, and productivity will become greater and greater. Um, I mean, to the degree that if, if you're just basically sitting in your car, the car is fully autonomous and driving somewhere, it's kind of like being in, in a, being, you know, the car is essentially your chauffeur. And, and then uh, the things that become important are, okay, well, let's, uh, let's have good entertainment. And, uh, you know, if you want to do some productivity stuff, then that, that actually starts to become much more important because you're no longer spending your attention driving the car. So it will be extremely important in the future. Should we do some of the say.com questions? OK. Should we do the second one? Uh, yeah. Uh, the first one, I think we already answered. Like, if, we're, if, we have, um, if we're able to make enough sales, we w which we'll try to do, or we, we will supply other companies. Uh, it's definitely not an intentional effort to keep the, the sales to ourselves. Uh, if we can make enough for other companies, we'll d we will supply them. And we're trying to do you know the right thing for ad advancing the s sustainable energy, whatever that 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 is. So, vehicle to grid, we get asked that a lot. <laughs> um, I think one thing that's important to note is the uh, vehicle to grid. Uh, it, it doesn't in, unless you have a power cutoff, like you, you need to cut off your main supply to the grid. Otherwise, if you're if you lose the power in your house, you'll basically just b backflow uh, energy to the grid. So just having uh, a reversal in the, in the power flow does not actually uh, keep the lights on. Um, you, you need a whole separate system to cut off power to the grid. Um, and I think there's also the case that people really want the freedom to be able to drive and to uh, charge at their house. And it, it's obviously very problematic if uh, you know, you get to morning and your car, uh, instead of being charged, it, it discharged uh, into the house. And then you, you, f you sort of, okay, now I can either drive or ha use the battery to power my house. Uh, I, I think it, it's actually going to be better for people's freedom of action to have a power wall um, and a car separate. Um, and then you, then it's, uh, you know, everything works. The, the, the you know, and you add that, you basically combine that with solar, either, either solar retrofit or solar glass, uh, solar glass roof, um, and uh, local battery storage. So you basically become your own utility, um, and then the, the the car is uh, you know can be charged also with solar. Um, I, I think that's like the stuff that works. Uh, you know that said, uh, like we can certainly do vehicle to grid. Um, and I think we can uh, like we can basically enable that with software in Europe or something, right? Uh, yeah, <coughs> um, we are. Future generations of power electronics, we will be able to do this more or less everywhere from a like energy market participation perspective. But, but yeah, from a backing up the house, and it just so happens that the way the North American connectors are on all the cars in North America, it doesn't matter whether it's the Tesla connector or the, the connector that the other vehicles have, doesn't actually support powering your home. It's uh, unfortunate. So you'd need a, a, an additional hardware to do that. Um, but, but, but yeah, in the future, all, all versions of our vehicles will be able to at least do bi-directional power flow for the purposes of energy market participation. But even for that, it's important to remember that your car isn't plugged in 24-7. So it's kind of an unpredictable uh, resource for the grid. It'll have a value, but it's not the same as a stationary battery pack. Yeah, on, honestly, a vehicle to grid uh, sounds good, but I think actually has a much lower utility than people think. Um, I, I think very, very few people would actually use vehicle to grid, and we, we actually had with the original Roadster, we had uh, vehicle to grid capabilities. Nobody used it. Yeah. <laughs> how do we find the engineers to do everything we're saying? How do we find the engineers to do all these things? Uh, well, uh, I, I guess we recruit uh, we recruit a lot of engineers from, <laughs> from all parts of the world. Um, you know, I think Tesla has a good reputation for doing exciting engineering, um, and that tends to attract the, a lot of the top engineers in the world, because uh, they know that their efforts at Tesla will um, really uh, serve the greater good, um, and, and we're super hardcore about engineering. Um, you know, Tesla is like, first and foremost, an, an engineering company. It's like hardcore engineering is what we do. Um, like, the, the sheer amount of hardcore engineering done at Tesla is insane. Um, and if you look at, uh, say, uh, there's various surveys done of engineering schools, uh, where do you want to go? Um, like, what's your top choices? And actually, the top two choices um, last 
you know, last few years have been uh, Tesla and SpaceX. So sometimes it's Tesla first, sometimes SpaceX first, but those are the two top ones. Yeah, I mean, if you are motivated to solve some of these problems, which are the hardest problems in the world to solve that really fundamentally enable the future we all need, uh, please reach out. Yeah, and Help and us work on these problems. Absolutely. And like, like you said, the battle is far from over. Um, you know, less than 1% of the global automotive fleet has been converted to electric. Um, and uh, and even t maybe point one, less than 0.1% of stationary storage has been done. So stationary storage has barely begun. Uh, converting the global vehicle fleet to electric has barely begun. Um, so there's still a massive amount of engineering work to be done at Tesla and, and other companies to uh, accelerate this transition to sustainability. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, this is Jordan from Mark Asset Management. Um, so you've talked about the importance of the factory, and you've mentioned the ground-up design process and a lot of the new things that you're going to be doing or started to do in Shanghai, Berlin, and Austin. Can you just maybe help us understand and, and quantify like how financially meaningful all of those improvements will be? And then given what you're trying to accomplish as a company, is it fair to assume that the vast majority of improvement will be given back to the customer in the form of lower prices? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I think certainly uh, we will uh, try to give back as much as possible to the customers. It's not like, you know, it's not like Tesla's profitability is crazy high. Uh, you know, our, our average profitability for the last four quarters is like maybe 1%. So uh, just to be clear, it's not like, you know, we're minting money. Uh, our valuation makes it seem like we are, but we're not. Um, so. Uh, we, we, we do want to try to make the price as as competitive as we can without like losing money and if you lose money then you, you know you keep doing if you keep losing money you'll just die so we have to uh, this thing called profit is just like we need to bring in more money than we spend otherwise we're dead <laughs> so but affordability is key to how we scale yeah. right like the demand goes nonlinear as you reduce the the price of the car yeah it's, I mean it's important to, to sort of separate the, the difference between affordability and value for money uh, or desirability of the product so, uh, you know, for a lot of people, they want to buy a Tesla, they simply don't have enough money. Um, we could make the car infinitely desirable, but if somebody does not have enough money, they can't buy it. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, people, you know, kind of forget this. It's like, it's, it's not, it's like, somebody, ha people have to have enough money to buy the car. Um, and, and just making a car super desirable but expensive does not m mean they can afford it. So. It's absolutely important that critical that we make cars that people can that people can actually afford. Yeah. Um, so, I wish we could uh, over go here some of these uh, things. Uh, just scroll down or something. Oh. Uh, when do you expect Tesla vehicles to beat ICE vehicles on initial purchase price? I think a way to answer that question is, in the classes of vehicles we sell today, we're already doing that. Yeah, we're already pretty, yeah, pretty close. Um, and then f factoring in total cost of ownership, um, and the fact that electric vehicles, re vehicles require much less servicing um, and are way cheaper to run. Uh, when you when you look at like to you know total cost of ownership, and you can obviously lease a car. So if you just like lease a car or or get a loan for a car, you've got your sort of monthly payment, and then your cost for uh, either gasoline or electricity, um, and your cost of servicing. And the, the fully considered cost of an electric car is uh, much less than uh, a, a gasoline car of the same nominal purchase price. Um, you know, uh, I mean, that said, and like may, maybe on the order of, th you know, three years w uh, when we can do um, a, a lower cost, car, like a $25,000 car, um, you know, I think that will be basically on par, maybe slightly better than a comparable gasoline car. So I think maybe it's it's on the order of three years, ish. How have the technology advancements and increased vertical integration of battery manufacturing influenced your ability to improve the environmental and social impact of the supply chain? And I think, yeah. I think we sort of have said that already. Yeah. Do you have some ability to scroll through this? I just to scroll away. We covered recycling. Yeah. Well, sc just sc scroll until we've got stuff that we haven't covered. 
Uh, we definitely covered that top yeah, one. Yeah, a lot of the things, things we've already answered, I think. Covered that. That one. I think we, I think we literally just answered that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I saw a cathode durability question. Let's go to that one. Go down, go down, go down. Good technical question. Keep going. How are you going to address the cathode durability and cost environmental impact trifecta? Is this something you're going to leave the upstream supply chain to solve? No, I think we tried to answer that directly. I mean, we really are looking at not just what happens in the cathode facility, but like currently outside the cathode facility that should really be inside and removing processes that shouldn't have been there in the first place and uh, the use of reagents that add sh are just costly and not necessary and, and removing a bunch of white wa wastewater from the process. Guys, are there anything, is there anything you, you want to add to, maybe we could like uh, go through everyone and like maybe say what you're doing and, you know, say a few words, I don't know. Uh, sure. Um, I just want to reiterate the fact that this is a massive problem. Massive problem. And <laughs> it seems like Tesla's on its way and ahead, um, but we need everybody's help um, because it's, a, it's everybody's planet and we're not going to get to 20 terawatts by ourselves. So yeah. please think about this carefully um, as it affects everybody. So let's get on it. Yeah. And, and obviously, if you care about uh, solving sustainability uh, and doing hardcore engineering, uh, definitely come work at Tesla. <laughs> yeah, I, we, you know, we went through a couple of the manufacturing improvements. Uh, and you know, it kind of looks easy when you put together a nice slide deck. But the challenges are like this. It's super challenging when, when you take materials out of the process, when you integrate processes together, uh, you have to do a lot of things at once. And that's, that's like this immense engineering challenge. Uh, and so like, you know, to appreciate that, like, you need like to get through this, we need like the best engineers we've got. And we've got this awesome team. I just want to shout out also to all of our team watching, like, you guys are awesome. Like, you absolutely kicked ass putting this together. And yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Tesla team. Totally agree. Right yeah. yeah, that's it. Like, yeah. Right okay. Yeah. Rodney Westmoreland, uh, managing the construction here at Tesla. Um, what I would like to say is uh, one shout out to the team. The team has been working effortlessly. A very, very tough. Um, project here for 24 hours a day, it seems like, um, <laughs> around the clock to have this complete. Um, the thing that sets us apart from a lot of other construction, yeah, we have a construction company here. Um, the thing that sets us apart is that we're integrated in the manufacturing process. So every detail that comes from Drew's mouth is directly implicated into the system that we're, that we're building. Um, that way it what would typically take three or four months to create a specification. Our design team is working right with the manufacturing team uh, to allow us to speed that process up tremendously. So, Yeah, it's definitely a, a important part of the vertically integrated approach is to be able to design the factory around the equipment, in fact, together with the equipment, so that you can build the factory at lower cost and, and, and more quickly. Yeah, I'm Scott. Uh, I focus on cell design. I, I think it's hard to put into words how inspiring this is. I've been at this a long time with Tesla, and um, yeah, I really hope others since, since do join when, us. Since when, Scott? Since 2005, yep, yes. with many of you, um, but thank you. Um, you know, it, <laughs> yeah, you're before Drew, but <laughs> who's keeping track? <laughs> um, but I, I'm really stoked at what the team's been able to accomplish over the last you know, short period of time, about a year. It's been really an incredible transformation I mean, hopefully what we've shown you inspires you to join us or join somebody else in the effort. Um, and uh, I couldn't think of a greater, more intelligent, more hardworking team to be working on with this problem. Hi, Peter. Um, I lead the manufacturing uh, improvement team. And I, I guess the point that I would like to make is um, manufacturing improvements is like the accelerator. So, like, you think about the execution that Rodney talked about in terms of how fast we've been able to put together this factory, which is amazing and uh, something that's been really incredible to be a part of. That's not enough. What we need to do is improve the manufacturing technology. That's the real accelerator. 
And that's what we're really focused on. Elon talks about it all the time, that really going and improving that system is what will enable us to get to the scale and the cost that we need. Um, and then the other point that I would make is on the recruiting side, like it doesn't matter if you know about batteries, if you come from any industry, you can, you can do something fantastic in the, in the work that we're doing. Um, we talk to people from industries that you wouldn't imagine. Like I talked to a guy from a, who makes golf balls and he has stuff which is really impactful for what we're doing. So, you know, if you're in any industry and you want to be, uh, you know, impactful here, like come join us, it'd be great. Hi, I'm, <coughs> excuse me. Hi, I'm Tony. I've been working in um, lithium and cathode materials for almost 23 years now. And this is the most growth I've seen in a company. I've been here a little over a year and a half. Um, we're hiring amazing people that are allowing us to leverage technology that most of the industry is struggling to, to achieve. So to answer the question, how are we going to do this? We are really advancing the materials manufacturing for cathodes and for lithium beyond uh, what has been accomplished in the previous 20 years. It's exciting. Yeah, my name's Turner. Um, work closely with the team. I've worked a lot with, with everyone here. And um, on, the, on the cathode and upstream materials side, it's, it's really important that everyone understand that this, this growth is coming. This, this growth is real. We are going to make all of these batteries. And everyone needs to grow with us. The entire supply chain needs to grow with us. And if you have an idea that simplifies anything in the supply chain, come talk to us, come work with us, and uh, let's do it. Any, any existing specification is wrong. Any existing That's manufacturing method is wrong. Process equipment, it's wrong. It's just a question of how wrong. Yes. Quote exactly. Elon Musk. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we're wrong, just a question of how wrong. Just try to be less wrong. Go so ahead. tell us how we're wrong and how we could do it better so that we can accelerate and, and improve as fast as possible. All right, well, I guess uh, uh, thank you everyone for coming. I uh, hope you like the presentation. Uh, very exciting future ahead. Um, you know, uh, we're going to work our damnedest to transition the world to sustainable energy as quickly as possible. Um, and your support and help is, is key to that uh, success. So uh, thanks again. Uh, super appreciated. Um, and look forward to the next event. Thank you. Thank you.